So since I'm going to talk about the role of memory in cryptographic reductions, I will start with a short introduction to reductions. So usually when we constructed some cryptographic scheme and we want to show that it is secure, we, use, uh, we rely on cryptographic reductions. So suppose we have some well, hard problem P. What we do is we show that given any adversary breaking the security of our scheme can be turned into an algorithm uh, solving instances of our problem. More precisely, um, the algorithm we construct will run the adversary as a subroutine and answer potential oracle queries of it. And this in particularly uh, implies that the running time of our reduction will be at least the running time of the adversary and the same holds for the memory consumption. Now, uh, the tightness of our reduction can be seen as some sort of measure of its quality. What we usually do there is we compare the resources used by our uh, algorithm to the resource, uh, resources used by the adversary it runs as a subroutine and what we usually compare there are both running time and success probability. And if both time and success probability essentially stay the same, we say that the reduction is tight. Now to see why um, the tightness of a reduction matters for giving concrete security guarantees, we will look at the time success probability trade-off plot for our problem P, which might, for example, look something like this. So we see we have two axes indicating success probability and running time of our algorithm. And the plot is divided into two areas labeled as unbroken and broken. Now, if a point lies somewhere in the area labeled as unbroken, this means that According to current cryptanalytic knowledge, there exists no, uh, exist, uh, exists no algorithm which is able to solve an instance of our problem in the corresponding time with at least the corresponding success probability. Okay, so now suppose that we want uh, the scheme we constructed to be secure against all adversaries satisfying some constraints on running time and success probability. By our reduction, we know that we can turn this adversary, uh, adversary into an algorithm solving instances of our problem P. However, if the reduction is non-tight, we might actually end up with an algorithm which runs in considerably higher time and also succeeds with less probability. So in this example here, we see that we actually ended up with an algorithm in the area for which our problem is known to be broken, so we can't conclude anything on the security of our scheme. However, if our reduction was tight, the situation would look different. In this case, we would see that given any adversary breaking the security of our scheme, we would be able to construct an algorithm which outperforms all the currently best known algorithms in solving our problem. And this, uh, in this way, we gain trust in the security of our scheme. So as just discussed, usually when talking about tightness, we only consider running time and success probability. However, if, we, if one talks to crypt analysts, they will probably tell you that actually memory is also a very important resource and actually the most uh, expensive one. So in our uh, work, we consider the role of memory in cryptographic reductions, and we conclude that indeed, memory can be crucial when making concrete security statements. We also investigate, uh, started to investigate how to make reductions memory tight, meaning how to obtain reductions essentially preserving the same uh, memory requirements as the algorithms we started with. And we do this by giving a couple of tools which can be seen as a memory efficient replacement for typical non-memory efficient steps in reductions. We use those in one concrete application, namely giving a memory tight reduction for the RSA full domain hash signature scheme. And finally, we asked ourselves whether there also exist reductions which cannot be both tight and memory tight and actually found some evidence pointing in that direction by proving some lower bounds. So now let's look um, why memory in reductions uh, matters. So for this, we are going to look at time memory trade-offs. So an, an important observation here is that for several problems which are relevant for crypto, the best known algorithms actually require high memory 
or to phrase it differently, we are, uh, some problems are harder to solve if less memory is available, and this in particularly holds for several lattice or coding-based problems. And as we both see now, uh, this needs to be taken into account when deriving concrete security statements. And we will look at a concrete example, namely the learning parity with noise problem. So, so far, we have looked at uh, time success trade-off plots. Now, when we add memory, we would, we would actually have to look at a three-dimensional time success memory trade-off plot. However, to keep things simpler and two-dimensional, uh, I will only consider algorithms having a constant success probability, so we will now look at trade-off plots in this plane. So, okay. Um, we see uh, that the time memory trade-off plot again has two axes. Now the x-axis indicates the memory consumption of an algorithm. So now if a point lies in the area labeled as unbroken, this means that uh, according to current cryptanalytic knowledge, there are no algorithms known which are able to solve instances of LPN in the corresponding time and with the corresponding memory. Now for LPN, this time memory trade-off plot is essentially determined by two algorithms, the first one being the Gauss algorithm, which we see here. So as we can see, it's able to solve instances of LPN given enough running time, but the memory essentially plays no role here. Now the second algorithm would be the BKW algorithm. We see it's able to solve instances of LPN in considerably faster time. However, this comes at the cost of some uh, an increased memory consumption. So overall, the time memory trade-off plot for LPN looks something like that. And actually, due to some recent results by Essa et al., which will also be presented here at Crypto, it looks more like this. So now, again, suppose we constructed some scheme S, and we want to show, that, uh, and we want it to be secure against all adversaries satisfying some time and memory constraints. Now an observation we can make is that even if our reduction is tight, meaning that it preserves essentially the running time, it might still not be memory tight and actually um, have a way higher memory consumption. Now, we would end, uh, now again, we would end up with an algorithm in the area for which LPN is known to be broken and we can't derive anything on the security of our scheme. However, if the reduction would also additionally be memory tight, meaning its uh, memory consumption would essentially be the same as the memory consumption of the underlying adversary, the situation looks different. Now we see that from any algorithm breaking the security of our scheme, we are able to construct an algorithm outperforming even the best currently known algorithms in solving LPN, and we gain trust in the security of our scheme. So, as we have just seen, for some problems which provide particularly good uh, time memory trade-offs, uh, memory can be crucial when making concrete security statements. So we call these problems memory sensitive, and they, for example, include LPN, as just seen, the shortest vector problem, or the problem of finding a collision of three points in a hash function, and also discrete logarithm uh, over finite fields, for example. However, for other problems, um, the best known algorithms uh, only require small memory. So in this case, while still a memory tight reduction yields a stronger result, it's harder to measure its advantage. And well, problems of this type, for example, could be to find a collision or a pre uh, in a hash function and pre-image resistance in hash functions or solving the discrete logarithm problem over elliptic curves defined above prime fields. Now I want to illustrate that indeed uh, typical reductions um, often contain steps which uh, result in our uh, algorithms having a higher memory consumption. For this we're going to look at two examples. The first one being the simulation of a random oracle. So a random oracle is an idealization of a hash function and works as follows. The adversary has access to an oracle which it may query on points and as a, in response it's going to get a un, uniformly distributed bit string. However, since we are modeling a hash function, 
um, querying the oracle on the same point several times will result in the same answer. So this is usually simulated in um, reductions using lazy sampling. And this is by keeping track of a list of query answer pairs. So whenever the adversary queries its oracle for the oracle value on some point, we check whether this value has already been defined. And if not, we would sample a fresh random bit string, store it, and then return the answer. And it's important to, to note here that we really have to st uh, store the answers to our queries uh, since the adversary might query its oracle several times on the same point. So in the worst case, we could actually have an adversary which essentially does nothing but query its random oracle. And in this case, we would end up with a reduction which has to provide uh, additional memory which is of the order of the running time of the underlying adversary. So the second example uh, occurs when checking for freshness uh, of messages in the unforgeability game for signature schemes. So here we have an adversary which has access to a signing oracle which it may query on messages in order to obtain signatures on them. And in the end of the game, it's going to output a forgery attempt consisting of a message and a signature. And it wins the game if the signature is valid on that message and what I want to concentrate on here, if the message is fresh, meaning it has not, so far not been queried to the signing oracle. And this checking for freshness is usually done by simply keeping track of all messages um, queried to the signing oracle. So again, in this case, we might end up with a reduction having to provide uh, uh, significant additional memory. So to give a short recap of what I have discussed so far. So currently, at least in uh, most of theoretical work, uh, the memory consumption is often ignored in reductions. And also many existing reductions contain steps which uh, result in the constructed algorithms having highly increased memory consumption. And this seems particularly problemat problematic for memory sensitive problems, that is for problems which provide good time memory trade-offs. So how can we achieve memory tightness? To give some examples for that, we are going to revisit the examples from a minute ago. So the first one was the simulation of a random oracle via lazy sampling, where we had to keep track of a list of queries and answers to queries in order to be able to provide the adversary with a consistent simulation of the random oracle. And now this can be made memory efficient by using a pseudorandom function. This is actually, actually something which was already noticed by Bernstein in 2011, but not formally analyzed. So here, what we would do is we would sample a key for our pseudorandom function, and then whenever the adversary queries its random oracle on some point, we would derive the answer to this query deterministically using our pseudorandom function. So in this uh, way, we don't have to store the answer anymore to be able to provide the adversary with a consistent simulation. And it's quite easy to see that any adversary which is able to distinguish this simulation of a random oracle from a proper random oracle would be able to break the security of our pseudorandom function. So the second example occurred when checking for freshness of messages in the unfortability game for signature schemes. So here, um, the adversary had access to a signing oracle and in the end uh, output a forgery attempt consisting of a message and a signature and we wanted to check whether the uh, output message indeed was fresh. So this can be made memory efficient in the following way. So the general idea here is to use the adversary itself as memory. So what we would do is we would still answer the signing queries in the usual way but no longer store the corresponding messages. And at the end of our reduction, when the adversary outputs its forgery attempt, we would store the message and then rewind the adversary, meaning we would run it a second time, providing it with the exact same random coins and also answering all of its signature queries with the same answers. If we do this, 
The sequence of messages submitted by the adversary to the signing oracle will be the same. So now, whenever uh, the adversary queries for a signature, um, we could simply check whether this message um, is actually the message it forges on. So in doing this, we only have to store one message. Uh, however, this comes at the cost of potentially running the adversary twice. And an important thing to note here is, since we want to rewind the adversary, we actually have to store all the coins um, provided to the adversary and used to derive signatures. But this could be done in a memory efficient way, again, using a pseudorandom function. So a final thing I want to talk about is lower bounds. So um, showing that for some reduction, it seems not possible to obtain, uh, obtain a version of the reduction, which is both tight and memory tight. For this, we're going to look at two versions of the unforgeability game for signature schemes. The first one just being the usual uh, unforgeability against chosen, chosen message attacks uh, for signature schemes. So in this game, the adversary has access to a public key and a signing oracle, which it may query on messages in order to obtain signatures on them. And in the end of the game, it's going to output a forgery attempt consisting of a message and a signature, and it wins the game if the signature is indeed valid on this message and if the message is fresh, meaning it has not been queried to the signing oracle so far. Now, the second game we're going to look at can be seen as a multi-forgery attempt version of the first game. So again, the adversary has access to a public key and a signing oracle, but now it's no longer restricted to make a single uh, forgery attempt. Instead, it, uh, it's allowed to make many and can do so at any point in time. And it wins the game if any of those forgery attempts is successful, meaning that uh, the signature is valid and the message so far has not been created to the signing oracle. Now, one could argue that this actually models more realistically what we expect of uh, a signature scheme, since the restriction to a single forgery attempt seems somewhat artificial. However, of course, we would like uh, to use the more simple version. And this also seems justified, since there is a tight reduction from the multi-forge game to the forge game. To see that, note that a forge uh, adversary can check signatures itself for validity. So the reduction would essentially boil down to checking whether a message is fresh. And this could, for example, be done by simply keeping track of all messages submitted to the signing oracle. However, then the reduction is non-tight. Another thing we could do is to simply guess which of the forgery attempts of the adversary would be on a fresh message. However, then we would end up with a reduction having a lower success probability. And the final thing we could think of is actually to rewind our adversary at each point uh, when it makes a signing query in order to check for freshness of the message, but this would result in a higher running time. So as we have seen, there are several trade-offs for reductions from the mForge to the Forge game, but all of them uh, lose a fact, uh, factor uh, in order of the order of the adversary queries in one of our resources. But since mForge is probably the more realistic game and Forge the simpler one, we would clearly prefer a reduction which is both tight and memory tight, so obtains once in all, in all over the row. However, this seems not possible, and indeed we are able to show a theorem which informally looks something like this. So uh, for a certain class of black block reductions from mForge to Forge, it's not possible to be both tight and memory tight. So the proof uses streaming algorithms, which are algorithms uh, which have to process a large input but only have a small working memory, so they can only process its uh, input as a ordered stream of small chunks, uh, but make several passes over those uh, stream. And so the restrictions on our reductions essentially force them to behave as a stre uh, streaming algorithm where these uh, single chunks will correspond to the signing and forgery queries. And in this way, we are able to use a lower bound on the amounts of passes a streaming algorithm has to make over its input in order to compute certain functions. So to give a very short conclusion, 
Memory in cryptographic reductions does matter and it should be addressed when uh, coming up with reductions. Also, it seems possible for many reductions to add a simple fix, but there also are reductions which seem to be inherent memory loose. Thank you.